we get in just a moment right here at the top of the hour. All right, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started then. So thank you so much for joining today. We're excited to have everybody here and uh, joining us for um, a session on how to help your leaders navigate change effectively. I'm sure that as a topic, first of all, if you're here, that's probably something you're interested in. But I know it's something many of us are navigating, um, you know, on the daily. Um, and so we're excited to be able to share some insights with you today on, on how to do that. So what we're going to be focused on today is um, exploring how change affects your employees. Um, discussing your role as a change leader and as a change coach, and sharing a framework for navigating and leading through change. Um, so that's that's the session today. I'm Caitlin Corda. I'm the head of marketing, brand, and business development here at Blue Beyond Consulting. Um, and before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping. I wanted to just mention to folks, um, do use the chat feature for any technical issues. If you're having trouble seeing the slides or you can't hear the audio, anything like that, do let us know and we'll try to fix that as quickly as we can. There's also a Q&A feature to ask questions during the webinar. I'll be monitoring that um, and responding to questions and things within the chat and bringing things up live during the session um, if needed. Um, and then the webinar recording will be made available on our website um, and afterwards um, if you'd like to listen to the materials um, at a later date. So just so you know that that is happening as well. Um, great. And uh, with that, uh, let's see. I think the next thing is let's go ahead and introduce Blue Beyond. Um, for folks that don't know, Blue Beyond is a, is a boutique management consulting firm, and our mission is to build effective organizations where both the business and the people thrive. Um, we've been in business since 2006 um, and, and very happy and thriving about that. And really what we want to do today is just get right into the topic. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our hosts and our speakers for today. First, we have Liana Escobedo um, Rendazzo, who is one of our consulting leads here. She's been here for eight years, um, one of our senior leaders and consultants in the area of organizational effectiveness, um, talent, and change. And then also my friend and colleague, uh, Gerald Goodrich, um, who has been in the field for seven, seven plus years, Gerald, probably more than that by now, um, in, in talent and change um, and organizational effectiveness as well. So we're very happy to have you both today um, speaking on a topic that I know is very near and dear to your hearts and something you're actively engaged with clients um, on a daily basis about. Um, so we're really excited to hear from you both on kind of just how you think about this subject and, and some of the things that, that you've personally seen out in the field and, and what's working. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you two, and um, we're, we're excited for the content today. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, yeah, Gerald and I are excited to, to speak with you all today um, and share some of that experience. Like Caitlin mentioned, we'll be exploring a bit about how change affects your employees, uh, discuss your role as a change leader and a coach through those changes, um, and share a bit of a framework or even a couple frameworks for navigating and leading through change uh, that we've found to really just resonate uh, out in the field um, with folks. And uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, that change is the only thing that isn't changing. Everywhere we look, um, you don't have to look far. If you see these headlines, uh, you know, COVID-19 drastically changed the way that we work and think about work and live our lives and the way our kids go to school and just really changed um, a lot of things in a lot of ways for us. Uh, the, you know, kind of return to office, return to work. A lot of companies are working through what does that look like now? What does that look like? It's different than it looked six months ago. It'll be different again in a year or so as we all kind of discover kind of our new way of, of working together. Um, digital transformation is affecting a lot of our clients, making really big changes to just foundationally how they operate, how they work. Um, you know, the presence of AI, um, a lot of companies trying to figure out, like, what is that? What do I do with that? Um, you know, how can it help us? What do we need to be thinking about? How do we get ahead of that? What is there even to just know about it? Um, you know, something that's kind of rapidly shifting and changing quickly every day. Um, not to mention all the changes we're going through in our own lives, right? About moving to a new city, looking for a new dentist, having an aging parent, you know, kids going to a new school. There's just all these layers of change that we all experience all the time. Um, we're curious to see in the chat if any of you wanna share, what are some of the specific changes that are top of mind for you? Maybe what brought you to this webinar today? Uh, what are some of those changes that you're seeing out in your workplace um, that, that your teams are navigating through right now? Um, we know there's a lot and we know that there's a lot that we can do um, and it can help ourselves and our teams a lot just to build that resilience 
and that understanding of given this sea of change that isn't going anywhere, how do we build that resilience? How do we build some of that foundational understanding to help us navigate through this kind of constant environment and change uh, in a way that is really kind of can help us feel successful and satisfied um, and, and, you know, thrive. So as we think about that, there are several different kinds of change. Um, and we're going to talk quickly about seven of them here. Uh, it can be helpful oftentimes just to name what is this change that we're talking about and how is it different than other changes that we've kind of managed through in the past? Or sometimes it'll be kind of a layered effect of this change has a couple different angles to it that we need to think about and handle differently given the nature of this change. Um, some changes are incremental. They're these small little adjustments, these little pivots that we make over time um, that sometimes we notice and sometimes we don't, right? Sometimes we just look back and go, gosh, do you remember when we used to do this that way? When did we, like no one announced it. It's just over time we've evolved the way that we do certain things. Um, so some changes are incremental. They're these kind of small adjustments and course corrections. Uh, sometimes there are unplanned changes, things that we don't see coming, we need to respond to in the moment. Um, oftentimes, this is an immediate reaction to an unplanned threat to growth or stability. Something external happens that kind of forces us to respond. And that, of course, our change management looks different in those situations because we're reacting quickly, rapidly, kind of without the opportunity to be as planful as we can be with other changes. We have technology changes, digital transformation, shifting to do new technologies and ways of working. Um, Gerald actually just worked with a client um, that was going through a major kind of technology transformation. He'll share a bit more about that in a minute here. Uh, we've got people changes. We've seen a lot of this, especially in the tech sector lately, right? Layoffs, hiring, new leader integration, um, updating performance management programs. There's a lot of different types of changes that can affect our, our teams um, from a people standpoint. We've got strategic changes as companies evolve, kind of shifting our focus and our strategic plan of the services that we offer, the areas that we're playing in, um, the strategic kind of shifts to give us the competitive edge um, as the world evolves around us. Transformative, transformative change, some of those more deep-rooted, deep-seated changes that fundamentally shift uh, who we are, what we do, or how we do it. Um, a lot of times these are things like new product offerings, pricing models, um, evolving our mission, vision, and values to kind of modernize, especially with companies that have, um, have a long history and legacy. We work with a lot of those types of companies that are saying we want to stay true to our history and who we are and the fabric of our DNA, and we know we need to evolve to stay relevant. And we need help figuring out how to weigh those two things to kind of change and evolve our culture without losing what makes us unique and what makes us us. Um, and that can be a really complex thing, especially when you've got a mix of employees that are long tenured and have been there for that history and employees who are just coming on the scene and are hungry for a different approach. Um, and so, you know, those transformative changes are oftentimes multi-year <laughs> efforts where we're really planning through how do we step into this change and how do we kind of help bring people along in the journey, which is something we're going to talk a lot about today. Um, and then you've got structural changes, um, kind of the more tactical, you know, mergers and acquisitions, having a new operations model, um, some of those more tactical structural changes. Um, and each of these types of change require a different approach, um, depending on who you are, who your people are, how ready you are for the change. Your change management plan is going to need to be unique. Um, and so we're going to talk today about kind of some of the different approaches and some of the things that we found to be universally true and universally useful, um, regardless of the type of change, to kind of set a foundation when you're stepping into a change um, initiative. And that common denominator is the people. Um, we know that organizations don't just change, the people in them do. And that's what brings change to organizations. And that for us is really the common thread um, is that, you know, to bring people along on the journey um, of change is really what makes the difference between success and failure when it comes to change initiatives. Change management itself 
is a practice that we use to manage the transformation of an organization's goals, processes, and technologies by focusing primarily on preparing, supporting, and helping employees to undergo that change. Um, this you know, research from HBR tells us 70% of change initiatives fail. And oftentimes we see that because we're trying to make change happen versus helping people change, right? And you'll see here 30% of change, you know, change initiatives are 30% more likely to stick when employees are truly invested in the change. When we take the time to help people understand what's changing, how they need to change, equip them to do that, change efforts become more successful. Not only that, employees become much more engaged because they're co-creating that future that you're yearning for. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about change management, proactive change management ideals help mitigate the risk of failure by helping employees and organizations understand, adopt, and drive the success of their programs. I'm sure you can all think of off the top of your head a recent change that maybe just maybe didn't fail, but you thought, you know what, that could have been better. Or we have one that straight up failed. But it's important for us to understand as we think about those things that there are multiple different ways to lead people through change. And some are more effective than others, right? The old school way of command and control change approach where, you know, historically, whether we've been changing a policy or adopting new software, bringing in new leadership, you know, companies have just pointed at the change and said, this is it now. This is how we do it. Failure to comply is going to violate the terms of your employment, and there'll be some sort of repercussion or negative action associated with it. And that approach was really only achieving the base level, le base level amounts of compliance um, with new ways of working. And um, typically, it required really diligent monitoring to enforce compliance. You know, compliance-based leadership only goes as far as the leader is paying attention. Once the leader turns their back we're all shifting back to our old ways of working and existing. The change itself didn't really take hold without significant expense, whether it's oversight, whether it's time, whether it's um, you know management investment in the long term. And really ultimately it's borne itself out as the least effective approach. Uh, a lot of us in, in, our, in our change history have really leaned into now this like just comms and training approach, which is not a bad way of going it. It's another way to look at how to manage change. Um, and it believes that if we could just provide instruction on how to operate, how to do the thing in the, in the new way, people will naturally get on board because it's how things will be in the future. I've heard it said uh, that folks that use this, there, there's a mindset of people don't do it because they don't know how or they don't want to. And the comms and training is going to get us there, which is partially true. True. And we've seen some success here. But the problem with this approach and why we think there are more effective ways to do it is that the, it provides a limited perspective on what it takes for the change to really take root and get into the water, as we like to say uh, here at Blue Beyond. People may figure out how to go along with the change, but it becomes kind of a back burner type of thing. Something they'll get to when they remember or they have the bandwidth or it becomes convenient for them to do so. And so really, a better way of approaching change is, is what we call the align or what's called the align and engage approach. Now, this approach to change uh, really understands what we've already stated, that organizations don't change, processes don't change. It's just words on paper. The people do. The people are the ones that are, are experiencing the change. And people change organizations. People are what our organizations are made of. If those people go away, we're not going to have anything to do. And so a change management approach that is centered on people and how they're going to understand, engage with, and ultimately operate in the future provides a better on-ramp for achieving the, the future that we want to have, our desired future state. This approach to change really lives up to the commitment that people are the business's most valuable asset. And the only really appreciable asset we have, computers are going to go out of uh, obsolete. We're going to have to maintain and upkeep buildings, but we can build and develop our people and drive and create a better organization through our change management approach. And so their understanding, the people's understanding and, and application of the change to their work and their behaviors is really what makes the change stick. Right. In practice, this means building a responsive change program that focuses on the employees and their behaviors and that are scaled appropriately to change uh, to the change that you're implementing. Right. Not every change is the same size and has the same scope. Um, all changes are not 
created the same. And so not all of them are going to be received with open arms based upon various different things. Not everybody is prepared for the change right now. We're, we've seen orga- we've seen organizations that have uh, change fatigue or frequent things like that. There are a thousand and one different reasons why change might not be um, adopted as effectively. And so taking this align and engage approach allows you to get a cl- get closer to the people, provide more support, really get aligned with them and guide them to understand how the change applies to them and how they're going to play a part so they can really in turn unlock the most potential for the organization and the future we have together. So let's just start a little bit by take, getting a greater understanding of how people experience change. One distinction that we've worked with uh, and and talked about when we talk about change versus transition and how we kind of untangle that people change that organizations don't. When we think of change, right, it's an event. It's often an external instantaneous situation you experience that's over in a moment. We were one way before and now we're this other way. Once the change happens, there's no going back. We cannot go to the previous way things were before, which is why we go through as people and understand the process of transition. Transition is almost a response to change, right? It's the internal process of what people are dealing with after a change event. The mental and emotional process your team and the people within your team experience. It's the questions you have to answer, the emotions you have to process through, and all of the new stuff, right, that you have to manage and deal with. The great thing about transition is that it's a predictable and repeatable process that we've seen every time people experience change, which is a beautiful thing because we can understand it, we can plan for it, and we can lead and navigate through it. So as change happens, we know what to expect both for ourselves and our teams as they go through the process of transition. And so we th- when we illustrate this, we really want to think about it. Again, every change requires transition, whether it's planned or unexpected, whether it's something we perceive as positive or negative, right? Take these like three situations, um, for instance, right? With marriage, it's something we choose, we plan for. We spend months and years planning for these, our, our weddings, right? Um, but then there's this process of transition that happens, right? We go, we walk into a church or we walk into whatever situation, our, our religious institution or walk into the courthouse and you walk in one way, you walk out another, the change has happened. Now, what do we have to go through? There's a process of building a life with somebody else. What do we do with our finances? Do we want to start up? Do we want to have children? Where do we want to raise our children if we have them? What kind of schools? All of those things. Do we want to buy all, do we want all of the things, all of the all of it uh, that goes into it? Or you think about a car crash, right? That's not something we plan for. And it's definitely a negative experience that we've been through. But there's a moment right before where the two before the two cars have collided and a moment right after it, right? And there are thoughts, feelings, and emotions that we go through and actions now that we have to take and decisions we have to make as the transition happens. We think about insurance. We think about replacing vehicles. We think about the rental car, all of the things that go through it, right? Another unexpected but positive event, winning the lottery, right? We've all had the dream where we win the lottery. They pull your numbers, the big red ball comes in, and suddenly you have $380 million to deal with. You were, uh, you, had, you didn't have that before, and now you've got a lot of money to deal with. You're in a new reality with all the things that you go with. There are questions now I have to answer that have to go with it, decisions I have to make. What do I want to do with the money? Do I want to go on a vacation? Do I want all of the things, right? Um, but there's all those steps that we have to process it and understand and, and go through as we go through. These are some really common life experiences that that we can go through. But but again, we're talking about in our work and business context. And so Liana mentioned earlier, uh, I, have the, I have the privilege of, of being on site with a client who was going through a series of several uh, rapid acquisitions that came along with a tech change. Part of the acquisition process for them was to bring all of these regional partners under one HR and benefits umbrella. What that did for the organizations individually is that it allowed them to offer a greater and wider breadth of benefits to their employees and standardize some processes. But what it ha- what it caused for this, these organizations that have been operating for decades, for generations, we had a few of them in there, is there's new technology coming. And frankly, 
not everybody's open and, and welcome to tech changes. It's one of those things that everybody kind of dreads. And so part of the process for us was going through and helping folks understand, yes, this is me, but how does it impact me, right? Yes, I'm frustrated that I have to pull out an app to request PTO, but isn't it nice to not have to leave somebody a note, worry about it getting lost, and have instant access to how much PTO do I have left? What's left in my bank? Can I plan for that vacation in July, or do I need to fudge some things? And so under getting meeting people where they're at and helping them understand what is the the X's and O's, the ins and outs of it, and helping them process through and understand, yes, here's how I integrate with it, and here's how it's going to benefit us moving Forward. Liana has another example uh, of, a, of an organizational change uh, that we've helped navigate and, and, and the results from that. Yeah, so another example is we were working with a um, pharmaceutical company that had been acquired. And anyone who's been through an acquisition knows that there is that moment of change when a deal is announced. And unfortunately, that's pretty much all that changes in that moment, right? The deal is announced, and then there's this long, ambiguous period where as a standard employee, nothing changes, right? And yet you have this looming feeling that everything is about to change and you have no idea why. And we met this client right in that moment, right? Where their HR team and their leaders were saying like, we don't know what to, how to help people because there's nothing to tell right now. And we don't know how things are gonna change. We agree they probably are. Um, and so, just acknowledging with those employees um, that that's normal, right? That this is what happened. One of the things we realized is there were a couple of employees who had been through acquisitions before. The nature of the pharmaceutical industry is that acquisitions happen, right? And so there were a couple of employees who had been through this before, but most of them never had. So they just didn't even know like what the possible outcomes were. Um, and so there was a lot that we could do, even though we couldn't tell them what was going to happen, just to demystify what's possible, what's not, what's a realistic timeline to expect, and to create some space for them to just understand all of this kind of stuff about change and transition. And to tell mm -hmm. them, like, you've had your change moment. The transition is still unfolding and will continue to. And we really mm -hmm. focused our efforts on helping them understand what to expect helping them build some skills and build some community, honestly, just to understand that they were in it together and that, you know, they didn't have to kind of keep their anxieties about what if to themselves, that there was a safe space to voice that and to ask questions and to understand that there were lots of questions leaders weren't going to be able to answer, but it was still okay to ask them. And when leaders could answer them, they would. Um, and it was important for leaders to just understand what was on employees' minds, even if there was no clear-cut answer. Um, I think just I remember how significant it was when we introduced this concept to those employees, just to kind of understand, okay, what are the rules of this game? <laughs> and how what is reasonable to expect? Why am I feeling this way? Um, and Gerald's actually going to take us through um, kind of where we went from here and the kind of concepts that we introduced them to that just helped create a shared language and reduce some of that anxiety by at least helping people get the lay of the land about like, what do we know about change in general? If we don't know what's gonna happen to us right now, what do we know that's universally true that can help us kind of know what to expect and how to navigate through this situation? So like Liana mentioned, and like we've said a few times, we there is a three-stage or three-phase process of transition. And regardless of the change event, the size, the scale, the scope, the emotions around it, positive, negative, expected, unexpected, it is a predictable and repeatable process that people go through every time they experience transition. And the three stages are endings, the actual transition, and then the new beginning stage. And so with the change, when the change happens, first comes an ending. And with that ending comes a sense of loss. The old way of operating and existing is going away, and we're going to be in the new way moving forward. Regardless of the positive or negative of the change, the ending and the loss and the grief that's associated with it still exists. I think about my wife and I, we have three beautiful children, but when our first child was born, we were very happy, but there's a sense of everything's different now, 
right? We can't just pick up and go on vacation. We can't just do the thing, all of the other things we did before. There is a, it was a planned uh, change. It was an exciting change, but there was still all of the things that we had to figure out. And when the beauty of understanding this is that there will be times where we realize, oh, there's another thing that maybe is changing or different. We feel like we've gone through the transition and then we learn something new and we end up back dealing with the endings and the loss. So people identify more with what they're losing and how to manage those losses. We think about what's over and what's being left behind. And we also get to identify what can we keep, relationships, processes, whatever. And then we go into the actual transition state and deal with that sense of confusion about what happens next. We've often called this the messy middle of the change. It's an in-between time. The old is gone. The new isn't fully functional. We're learning new processes. We're creating new processes. We're figuring out our role and how we fit into it. But everything's still in flux. Uh, we have well-meaning concerns and how it's going to impact us, our teammates, and our work overall. Again, it's really where things are fluid and kind of messy. We have one foot in the past and one foot in the future. We're in that ambiguous in-between phase. Everything, the old ways are fading away, but the new isn't fully yet crystallized and operating yet. And then as we start to get answers, we start to get answers to our questions, our concerns are addressed, we start to feel like we have our feet underneath us more, we move into the new beginning stage. We start to accept the new reality in which we're living and begin to have hope for the future. The new understandings, the new values, and the norms are fully, um, start. we're starting to fully realize them. Most of our energy at this point now is facing the future rather than the past. We're focused on opportunities in our new reality. We seek to, in this stage, establish ourselves in our new roles or how our roles are being changed with an understanding of our purpose, the part we play in it, and how we can contribute and participate most effectively. And so in each of these stages, there are different things that your team needs to help feel good and process and navigate through. And so in the ending stage, we have to start by thinking about equipping our team with a mindset shift. We start by labeling the situation, the feeling. We acknowledge and learn that we can start to release and reframe it. We, I colloquially call it, we name it and claim it, right? What is it? All right, it's there. Let's move on. And so as leaders, we engage our team members in open dialogue. We check in regularly. Hey, how's it going? Our one-on-ones are very intentional. Sometimes they're heavy and awkward or whatever that might be. But we really dial in and get in. We roll up our sleeves and we start to help people process through those things. In the transition stage, that messy middle, we're dealing with the uncertainty of it. We're still kind of fluid. And so we start to focus on the behavior shifts, right? What are the specific actions and ways we can adapt and stay productive amidst the ongoing ambiguity? We identify, here's what's changing, here's what's staying the same, how can we start to build and prepare for the future that's coming and establish ourselves with a firm foundation? Once we've done that, once we've started, once we've gotten through and that transition stage continues to process, we now go on to the routine shift, right? Now we start to figure out our routine. And this is one of the reasons why change and transition is tough for people. People are creatures of habit. Most of us end up on Friday nights at the same restaurant ordering the same entree and the same drink because we know we're going to get it and we like it. And that's why the routine shift in the new beginnings is so important because people are creatures of comfort. So we help them adopt and adapt to the new operating models, the new systems, the new processes, the new routines. And we start to feel that level of comfort again, which again is why change is, is tricky for people because we don't want to lose our sense of safety and security that come with routines. Yeah, and I'll say too, I think, you know, the fact that this is a repeatable pattern, a familiar pattern can bring a lot of comfort um, that, you know, even though our habits are changing, we've seen this movie before. Um, that's why we use real life examples like marriage and the lottery and car crashes, because it's helpful to call people's attention to the fact that they have change skills. They have change experience, right? They have a lifetime of it to draw on. And a lot of times change management just starts with helping build people's confidence that they have what it takes to make it through a change, right? To make it through a difficult time um, and to call that attention. And I think we can do that for ourselves individually. We can do that as an organization as well 
to call attention to past victories, past mm-hmm. you know things that we've changed successfully. Mm-hmm. What have we learned that's helping us do this change better, right? What have we seen that works and why, why are we doing this this way? What's the intentionality behind it? So much of change management is confidence building and competence building, mm-hmm. right? And we can use that kind of past experience and just reminding people that this isn't the first time, it's not the last time, it's not the only time, um, but we've got transferable skills individually and we've got transferable skills collectively as an organization to do change. And we have to, to stay relevant, right? We have to, because the world around us is changing. Uh, my mom used to yeah. say, you can't stand still on a moving train. Like the world is moving. Um, and so we have to learn to, to keep moving with it. Yeah, Liana, I, I just want to say one comment on that because I yeah. think it's so important. And I, I feel like so oftentimes change within an organization, particularly like when you when you introduce, oh, there's a change management or we have a big transformation. It feels very heavy to people. And really just to remember that these are very human experiences and it doesn't take it takes intentionality. It doesn't always take a ton of time. It takes focus and intentionality to bring leaders, employees, managers through a change. And I think sometimes even just equipping them with language or the different types of change that you alluded to earlier in the session, or just to bring it into a real world scenario to, to remind people, it is really about that confidence building and to let people know that we like adults can learn, we can grow through these things. And I think that's why it's so core, you know, that we think about change happening with people, not to people. And it's a very simple thing, but when you're in the rush of really trying to run a business and trying to run an organization from one side to another, it's an easy thing to forget because you go through the mechanics of it. And sometimes just taking that time to really think about the human and the person and the experiences that you need to kind of call attention to really makes a difference in the adoption, the success of the change you're trying to drive. 100%. Um, Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I think too, just, you know, it, it having people at the center and listening to them, right? Like we've got people who are paying attention, who are seeing things we won't see. And so opening up that dialogue actually makes us smarter and better informed and more nimble as leaders too. Um, I think a lot of times there's a sense that like leaders need to carry the change and like figure it out and then tell employees what's happening. And the truth is that's really limiting the skills and the insight um, that we have to actually be able to to be successful in our change effort. I love what you said, Caitlin, about it not having to feel heavy. I think a lot of times too, it's like just as important to tell people what's not changing, right? We're so focused, laser focused on what's changing and informing people about that. A lot of times we can bring a lot of clarity and relief by just saying in no uncertain terms, here are the three things that aren't going to change. Here are the three things that are staying the same right now. We're not touching this. Um, can, you know, reduce a lot of like the inner kind of anxiety that folks have. So this is just kind of an overview of, you know, as as we think at Blue Beyond about kind of what are the underlying kind of philosophies to our approach to change? What kind of are the hallmarks of it? These are a few of those things um, that we found to really make for successful change efforts. Um, One is that we see people as part of the solution, not the problem. Um, We aim to bring people in as early as possible into the process. Again, to gather all that insight, to get them bought in, to help them start thinking there and imagining kind of the future and what needs to happen and get bought in. Um, Secondly, you know, we start with deep listening, actually paying attention, asking great questions um, to help uncover the why of the change, who the change is impacting and how. Oftentimes a single change can, you know, have many different impacts on different people, depending on where they sit in an organization. And sometimes it can be hard for us, for us, from where we sit to even understand how a particular change is going to impact someone in a different part of the organization. And so we always start with deep listening to actually understand, like, what is current state around this topic or this issue for different stakeholder groups? How are they experiencing the current state? what's working for them, what's not, what are they excited to see change, what ideas have they had all along and just are waiting for the moment when it's actually on the table for this thing to evolve. Um, So we start with deep listening just to get that 360 understanding of what is this thing that we're dealing with and how does it impact different people in different ways and what do we need to consider as we navigate through this change of the different impacts and different people that might need different levels of support or have different levels of engagement in the change. 
Um, it might be no news for some people. And that's good to know as we're setting out on a change journey. Um, we work with you to amplify what's working today, uncover potential barriers to change, illuminate the future state vision in a way that aligns, engages, and activates people to own the change. Um, this is huge. I think seeing what's working. What do we want to not break as we make a change? What do we need to preserve and protect about this particular way that we work? Um, and what are the things that are really ready for change? What are the potential barriers that we might come across? Um, you know, are there certain dependencies we need to plan for or certain groups that are going to need more time or more resources to be able to make this change? Um, and so that we can plan proactively for things that we can do to kind of get ahead of those things. Um, partner with you to plan, lead, and implement lasting change in a holistic, integrated way. I think this is a lot of what Caitlin was talking about, of like, we don't want change to happen to people. We want it to happen with people. To the best of our ability, we want it to feel like a natural, organic progression in the right direction, right? And there are ways that we can help people see that and feel that way about it with the right messaging, with the right kind of information, with the right planful approach, um, and, and really taking a 360 view to see like what else is connected to this thing that we need to kind of keep in mind so that people can see the bigger picture of what if and kind of understand how this change we're doing connects to other things. Um, that helps prevent change fatigue. When we can think about, oh, I need to change us to a new ERP next year. <laughs> and the year after that, we're going to be changing this other piece. Um, when we can be planful about that in advance and tell the whole story from the beginning and kind of lay out like, here's the big evolution that we're making in the next three years. Here's our three year plan. It's going to start with this ERP and then and we can lay that out to people. It feels more like one change versus three or five or six different changes. So just thinking holistically about what's the bigger thing we're trying to achieve here and what are the different changes that are going to get us there and how can we help people see those connections and tell that story in a way that feels like one holistic evolution versus death by a thousand paper cuts because every time I look, they're changing something on me. Um, and the last thing is to work alongside you. You know, Caitlin said adults can learn. Organizations learn all the time. Um, at Blue Beyond, we say we learn for a living. It's our full-time gig to learn um, and adapt. And um, so, you know, as you roll through a change, you're going to discover things you didn't know before, right? You're going to get feedback from people. Someone's going to come out of the woodwork who's been doing it a different way for years. And now you need to understand why they've been doing it that different way and how can it incorporate here? Um, and so it's important to have a plan, but it's also important as we engage employees and engage in a change to be constantly looking for those inputs and adapting to make sure that, you know, we're, we're going about it in the best way possible, given all the information we have available as we move through um, and that we're constantly kind of learning from the experience of change to make ourselves better. Caitlin, Gerald, anything you would add there? No, I think that's great. I think that's great. All right. Yeah. So uh, change can look, change support can look a lot of different ways. Um, what we want to do now is just give you a little preview of one of the tools in our toolkit um, that we use sometimes to um, help equip leaders and organizations to navigate change, um, which is specifically a, a navigating change workshop um, that has, you know, some of that core information that can help build that competence and that confidence and that shared language among employees and leaders. Um, in your organization when you're going through change. This is one of those tools that as we're coming up with like kind of a bigger change strategy, this is one of those tools we have in our toolkit um, that oftentimes ends up being a helpful kind of piece of the puzzle. Um, and so what this can look like, and again, oftentimes gets adapted based on the needs of the organization, um, but generally kind of as it stands is a two session workshop um, the first session um, is, is where we start with everyone. So it can be just for leaders or it can be for all employees, um, which is really focuses on some of the core concepts we introduced you to today, just understanding change and transition. 
what are the rules of this game? What are the predictable patterns and things that are helpful to just understand that are universal truths about how humans experience change and transition? Um, we use this opportunity to build that shared language, to introduce some of those core concepts and to enhance self-awareness by giving people a chance to actually pause and reflect on how am I experiencing this change? Where am I experiencing sense of loss, transition, new beginnings? Um, and to explore strategies of resilience, to get some practical tips of what are things that I can specifically do to help me be more successful as I navigate through this change. And so that first session is all about the self. Just where am I? Where am I? What is reasonable to expect? Help me get upskilled and just get some foundational knowledge about change that can help me manage myself more effectively. As you can see, that's helpful for everyone. It's also the best place to start for leaders. Leaders often don't get the luxury of going through a change and then leading people through change. Leaders oftentimes have to lead themselves through change as they are leading others through change. And so building on the foundation of that first session, starting with putting our oxygen mask on first, right? Understanding about change, understanding about myself, taking a minute to assess where I am in this whole process. Then we turn our attention to what do you need to do to lead others through change as you're leading yourself? How do you listen and connect with empathy? How do you communicate with clarity and focus? How do you enable motivation and ability? What do you do in those what if situations? What if someone asks you a question you don't know the answer to? What if someone asks you a question you're not allowed to share the answer to? What if someone asks about something that you haven't thought of yet? We actually get into some of those really tactical what ifs that leaders find themselves in that can be such challenging situations um, and share some of that situational guidance um, in that second session to really equip leaders with some of those foundational skills that they need. Um, yeah, Gerald, you want to kind of share a bit about this? This is one of those core um, kind of experiences and activities of how we bring that change model to life and help folks apply it to their current situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, you know, we have the, the change and transition is a three stage process. And so in this workshop, and again, we can we've applied this uh, as a standalone, we've applied this as kind of integrated into a larger change plan. But one of the things that we do in this workshop uh, is do the, this interactive activity that we call our transition wall. And so we, we've done this both virtually and in person, there are various different ways to do it. But essentially what the group does is they take a moment and they pause. Right. One of the things that, that gets in the way of, of change and transition is that oftentimes we don't take a moment to pause and think, where am I at? What am I going through? And how do I get through it? So that's what this activity is about. It's about taking a moment, pause. How does it feel during the ending? What am I losing? What does that feel like for me? What do I identify? What do I look like in those stages? And then we do that again for the transitions. And then we do that again for the new beginnings. And it allows people to identify where am I at? What am I going through? And what are some signs? If I'm having trouble figuring out where I'm at, where my team's at, where the people around me are at, what are some things that I can pick up on that maybe um, that that will that will help us get a get a feel of where they're at? And this experience really helps people consider other perspectives, right? I go through the endings like this. Somebody else goes through it like that. So we can compare and contrast those things, build empathy, build kind of the arm in arm mentality of this is how I'm processing it. This is how they may be processing it. How do we go forward together? We often hear things in this, in this moment like, I thought I was the only one that was worried about that. I thought I was the only one that has to go do a moment in the, in the big stall in the bathroom and just collect myself. I thought I was the only one that feels anxious when I wake up, right? I hadn't considered those things, um, or I haven't considered how this change could be good. I haven't considered those things. It, it's a massive, a, a, a big aha moment for folks in it. Um, it also collects some really valuable insights for leaders on what's top of mind for people, right? What are they going through? We had uh, an organization's uh, change change leadership team in one of these sessions and they were taking feverish notes during this session on oh i didn't know this was a concern people had oh let me add this to our communication strategy oh we do need a process around that because people are nervous and so it serves multiple functions it's a really great
great like Swiss army knife activity built into this workshop that again is part of a larger change strategy that helps us move the ball down the field for folks. It helps people process through their emotions. It helps leaders gain valuable insight into where people are at, how they're processing, and really what we can do collaboratively and collectively to move forward together. That's great. Once we have that sense of where we are, then it's about, okay, what do we do? Um, this is one of my favorite kind of pieces that we introduce to folks because it's not a big, heavy action plan. They are small behavioral pivots that people can make in the moment to shift the dialogue to a more positive and productive place, um, which I find oftentimes is the hardest part of change is we're all going through it together and we're caught, someone says something to us and we're caught on our feet and we're trying to figure out what to say. So this just gives some if then guidance to folks. If you know you find yourself complaining or you hear other people complaining, just notice that and redirect the conversation to solution talk. If folks are really catastrophizing, notice that and actively challenge those extreme views, right? If you hear people really criticizing ask them to give equal airtime to acknowledging the good. We're not chastising people and saying, you can't talk about the negative. No, we need that. We need that feedback, right? We need people who are thinking critically about what could go wrong. Like we need that engagement to help us be successful in the change. Where it gets toxic and problematic is when that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about the possibility or the end goal that we're working towards. And so one of those pivots can be just noticing when someone's being really critical, listen, take them seriously, take the concerns on board and have that pivot moment to ask folks to give equal airtime to what's going well that we need to keep doing and supporting. What's going to be good about this outcome that we're achieving together? What do we need to do? How are we supporting each other? Just balance the conversation is the goal. Um, when we hear speculating, which we hear a lot, just focus on the facts. Right. A lot of times just this, these little guideposts can be really helpful to employees just to say, here's what you might notice and here's what you can do. And you don't need a leader or the organization or corporate communications to do this for you. These are little things that you can do on your own in your environment to kind of create an atmosphere that supports the change that we're all trying to make together. So those are two tools that are helpful for everyone. Um, this is the model that we use to really take leaders through. What does change leadership look like? Um, and for this, we use a framework called head, heart, hands. So we start with the head work. It's about understanding how change affects people, right? Um, notice where people are and meet them there. Once we do that, we need empathy. We need to understand how to connect with others in a way that acknowledges their current experience, including someone could be feeling great, right? Someone on your team could be super amped about the change, really excited about it, while others on the team are feeling a real sense of loss because they've been doing it the old way for a long time. Empathy in a leader is about noticing both and being able to show up for both of those team members in a way that acknowledges their experience and helps them move through the change process. So it's about leading with empathy, making yourself available, checking in regularly with your team members and giving leaders just the emotional, empathetic EQ capacity to be able to do this while they're managing their own stuff. Um, and then the hands work, right? How do we get to work? How do we guide our actions that we take to support our team to actually get to the tactics of making this change real? Um, and so we provide tools for how do you simplify and prioritize? How do you build engagement through accomplishment? How do you communicate and reinforce? We really get to those tactics of the how to's of change um, that are going to help leaders kind of mobilize their teams at the local level while still taking into account the people, the humans <laughs> that they are helping to adapt to this new way of operating. There's a lot that goes in to kind of sharing these key concepts and these skills with leaders. So this is a very simplified kind of overview, uh, but it is kind of the high level framework that we use just to think about the different dimensions of change leadership that are important to address to really set a leader up to successfully lead a team through change. 
so Liana mentioned that the head, the heart, and hands, and this is one of the the models that we equip folks stuff both to understand, get their head around it, and really understand it and kind of get with the heart part and empathize with their team. And it's that people experience change and transition at different stages, at different times, and move through it at different speeds. And so one of the big, another one of those light bulb moments for, for leaders is this concept right here that I may have been sitting with the change for six weeks, six months, a year. My team just found about it six minutes ago. So why am I expecting them to process through it as quickly as I have? And so I've had time to process through it. I'm well into my transition. This just ended for them based on their own feelings, their own context, they're gonna move through it differently. How much is this impacting me? What is the change going to do for me personally? All of those things impact how I move through it. So it's important for leaders to understand that just because I am through and into the transition or the new beginning, they're just finding out about it. So help them move along. And ultimately part of the power, again, of the first half of the exercise, when we talk about what am I going through, I can use the things that I process through. Yep, I felt that way. Here's what helped me understand it, right? So getting them to understand, here's how people process through the head is going to help impact how they connect with and empathize with their teams ultimately and help us move through this successfully. Because if we don't address those things, that natural question, the natural concern for my job and the people around me will eventually fester and metastasize and turn into change resistance. And so that's why this model is so vitally important for people to understand and why, again, the light bulbs just go on and the shoulders relax. And it's one of my favorite moments um, as we talk to people and share this with them. Another moment as we talk about kind of the, the hands portion of it is giving people, and Liana mentioned the simplify and prioritize um, model that we share with folks. So we take a moment, a big chunk of it, and actively ask, uh, ask them to practically list what's getting in our way of this transition, what's moving us forward toward the transition, and then let's figure out what of that can I control. Okay, great. That's your change plan. That is a simplified change plan that I can execute on my team any day of the week, any month of the year for any change that we experience. Sit down, get our team together, brainstorm. What's getting in our way? We call those blockers. What's moving us forward? We call those boosters. What's in our control? What can we influence? What's out of our control? Simplify, prioritize, let's move forward. And so we've got other models and other resources in the in the workshop and that we employ um, not just in the workshop but outside of the workshop in our larger change management uh, efforts but we wanted to give you a sampling of some things that we do offer to folks as a part of the kind of the change suite that we have and so with that i want to pass it back over to caitlin uh, for our q a and the wrap-up sure thanks gerald that was really helpful i'd love to just open it up to anybody that has questions you can put them in the chat um, you are available to come off mute and um, and while folks do that or if there are any questions, um, I just I just thanks to thanks to you both. I think this was a really engaging session. And one of, one of that that last point that you made, Gerald, is one of my favorites, is, especially as someone who's helped folks go through change, like just remembering that you're going through it at such a different pace. You know, you've been thinking about this for a long time. And when you finally get to the point where you hit send on that, you know, big email or you bring folks together for that, you know, town hall or whatever it is, that's the first First time that they're experiencing it. And I think that just being being really mindful and cognizant of that when you're helping an organization or humans through change is a really important to know kind of where you are in that change, where your employees are and where your leaders are. And oftentimes I, my, my guess is folks on this call are kind of dealing with that at both ends, right? With executives as well as kind of, you know, people managers, employees. So I, I've always really um, found that framework to be really useful just all the time. I mean, just even for my own self. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Great. Okay. A couple things in the chat, but I think I think that might wrap us up, folks. So thanks to everybody. And if anybody does have any questions or thoughts after the session, feel free to get in touch with any of us directly. Um, our information is here. Um, you'll get the recording as a follow-up. And we just appreciate your time. And um, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you found something valuable from this session. And we'll see you out there. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>